Hey, this morning, I want to I wanna go straight to the Word, and I, I've got some things I want to share with you um, that I believe are prophetic for your church. And when I say prophetic, I just simply mean I believe that, that God has a Word for you today. Uh, I want to just share um, some thoughts that I've titled, actually, Gather at the Table. Gather at the Table. And I want to... Um, I want to go to this idea today, and I want to read a couple of key scriptures to you. Um, and uh, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you just get your Bibles and turn there, that'd be amazing. Uh, I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians 11. I'm also going to read Acts chapter 2, and uh, we're going to bounce between these two scriptures this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, And he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes. I want you to notice, just go back. Um, go back one slide. I want you to notice something. Uh, I want you to notice uh, the word supper. Everybody say the word supper. Uh, we don't, different families use terminology speaking about dinner time or supper time differently. Some call it dinner, some call it supper, some call it McDonald's, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, uh, we like to have a meal. We like to have a meal. We like to sit at the table. Last night, a group of leaders met. We sat at the table and we had a meal. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed that when we read this scripture during communion time at church, if you're around the church a lot, you would understand communion, table of the Lord. Uh, we um, frequently in church gatherings get a little cup of juice and a little piece of bread, and we call it the table. We call it the meal. We call it um, the Eucharist. There's a variety of terms that we apply to it, but at the end of the day, we often don't stop to realize that the early church and Jesus himself didn't just pass a little piece of bread around the table and a little cup. They had a meal together. The church was actually centered around the table. It was centered around the idea of fellowship, community, sharing, participation, and a lot of really, really good food. Can I hear an amen in the house? Amen. And uh, I want you to capture this, that, that a word like supper is used in the middle of what we often refer to as the table of the Lord, but they were having a meal together. And I want you to see this because gathering at the table, which is a community meal, gathering at the table was actually central to the life of Jesus And it became central to the first century church. And I want you to now see this in Acts chapter 2. I want you to turn there, Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read this in verse 42 to 47. Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47 says, They devoted themselves. This is believers. Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, Thousands of people were saved on a day called Pentecost. And as they started to develop a life centered around Jesus... I want you to see what that life looked like. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food. Isn't that interesting? The focus on table and home and food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, we like to focus on the addition of people. We like to focus on gathering in the temple, but I want you to notice the importance of gathering in homes and eating meals together. To gather at the table was central to the life of Jesus, and it was central to the life of the church. I asked yesterday a variety of leaders in the church, man, what what is one of the great strengths that this building has been able to afford you or offer you? And And uh, one of the nice things about it was was nobody said we're finally able to have meals together because I was at potlucks in your other building. You you, you guys know how to do meals together. Uh, You know how to do table. 
And it's part of the reason why I felt like the Lord wanted me to share this thought with you today, because you know how to gather at the table. But I believe that there is a wave of table ministry that, that God is, is speaking to and declaring to the church of Jesus Christ. I, I feel honestly a wave in the Northwest of something that God wants to do to stir the church, to open up the tables of our homes, to open up the tables of our churches and the tables of our lives so that we would bring both those who love Jesus and those who don't love Jesus, those who don't yet know Jesus, to the tables of our lives for the sake of breaking bread together and sharing the truth of what Jesus has done in our own personal lives. I I feel like there's something that the Lord wants to do and stir in this church today because of this. I, I grew up around a table. My mom and dad uh, were born and raised in North Carolina, and um, they migrated west when they were brand new married. My, my mom um, was seven months pregnant and when she rode the train for the first time out of the mountains of North Carolina and came across the United States. Um, my dad had come out a little earlier because he heard there was work in the woods. That's uh, the, the letter that somebody wrote to them. Uh, my dad couldn't find work. He was fresh out of the military. My mom and dad were newly married. She was pregnant. And, uh, and so my dad, unable to find work, heard there was work in the West. And he got in his car and drove across the U.S. and he told my mom, you wait here and uh, when I go get out and get settled, I'll send you some money. So he put $75 in an envelope, sent it U.S. Postal Service snail mail, uh, not cash app, and uh, he didn't send it by Facebook. He just sent it uh, the slow way. It got to my mom. She bought a train ticket and at seven months pregnant, rode across the United States. The first time in her life coming up the Columbia River Gorge had French toast for the very first time. And she tells the story and she said she thought she had died and gone to heaven. And, uh, and, and she, uh, she came out, didn't know anybody. Uh, she had wandered away from the Lord. My dad was by that time already an alcoholic and a mess. And they tried to establish a home out West with no friends and no family and nobody around. And as they started to build their lives, God interrupted uh, my mom's life. And God interrupted not only her life, but eventually interrupted my dad's life. And let me tell you the beauty of what brought them to the Lord. It was the need for a mom and dad. It was the need for family. It was the need for relationships. And as they started to get around some people that knew Jesus, they brought him into their homes. They brought him into their lives. They brought him to the table. And my mom and dad found a home. And they found a home in Jesus because they found a home uh, with people who love Loved Jesus. And there's something that began to stir in their life. And I remember getting up many times on uh, Saturday morning and our house would be full of people. My mom had started to work in the restaurant world. And so uh, she loved short order cook kind of stuff. And so on Saturday morning, she'd turn our house into a restaurant and people would come over and have pancakes and biscuits and gravy. And Sunday after church, people would come over for roast beef and mashed potatoes and gravy. And she just used our table to minister to people. I remember getting up one time in the middle of the night because I heard some Something going on out in our living room, and I got up and I came down the hallway, and my mom and dad had had uh, this young couple. He had gotten into all kinds of horrific sin and mess in his life, and came home in the middle of the night, and his wife woke up and found him stumbling in drunk, and she put him in the car and brought him to my mom and dad because they they knew that they could come to the table even in the middle of the night. And my mom and dad brought him into the living room and prayed and and ministered to them and 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 worked with them and had them over for meals and restored their lives and something began to shift in that couple. And today that couple are leaders in the church that my mom and dad had once been discipled in. And now the disciple became disciplers. And, and it all happened because there was openness and readiness to receive, not just at the altar in church, but at the table. And the table wasn't just in the church. The table was in their home. Something I believe today is, is, is being refreshed in the church of Jesus Christ. And it has to be refreshed because culture today is different than it was when my parents were young. In the 1960s, families ate together an average of five times a week, 90 minutes in length. In 2018, the average family in this part of the United States eats together one time a week and the average meal length is 12 minutes long. We've gone from five times at 90 minutes to one time at 12 minutes. There's something that we need to begin to understand, and that is the church of Jesus that we find in the first century was actually centered around the table. 
It was centered around mealtime and time spent together, not just a short order meeting where we come in like fast food and, and attend a service that's maybe 90 minutes long and we get right back out the door again. It was actually a family and a, a, a gathering that was centered not around a platform. It was centered around a table. There's something that I believe the Lord is wanting to stir in us because if we're going to actually be the church that Jesus has called us to be in this particular part of Washington State, then we've got to build according to the right model. We've got to build according to the right pattern, and we've got to look and see exactly how Jesus wants the church to work. There's a thought I'm going to put on the screen here for you, and it's going to tell us a little bit about the table as I see it in the Bible. And I'm going to kind of break down this statement and share three particular thoughts with you. So if you just go to the next slide, it's simply this, that the table is a sacred place. Everybody say sacred place. Where Christ is at the center and the participants experience a foretaste of eternity. What does that statement mean? Well, let's break it down and let's talk about what a sacred place means. First of all, I want you to capture this idea. Just next slide is that the table is a sacred place. The table is a sacred place. The word sacred actually means this. It, it means to, to be connected with God or dedicated to a religious purpose. When was the last time you saw roast beef and mashed potatoes as sacred? They themselves are not sacred. It's what happens at the roast beef and mashed potatoes. Last night when leaders gather, when you do your monthly potluck, it's a sacred opportunity. It's, it's, a, it's a holy moment. It's beyond just a food experience that you celebrate once a month. When you have somebody into your home and you sit down at a meal, can I tell you, in a Pinterest world, we, we work to make sure that something looks right and tastes like and, or, and, and, and smells like the pictures that we see when in reality it's what happens in the moment that's more important than the experience that you see. We're so worried about what it looks like, we want to snap a picture and post it rather than settle into the moment and allow an exchange to happen that's beyond the food and to realize that the Lord actually visits table moments. He actually visits them. How do I know that? Well, when I read in Acts chapter 2, there's something about the presence of the Lord that actually met the people at the table. You see, it's, it's not common that people actually consider their table a holy moment or a sacred experience anymore, but biblically it was because if I look at table in the Bible, I actually don't just find it in 1 Corinthians and I don't find it in Acts 2 alone. I actually find it in the book of Genesis. In fact, in creation before sin ever entered humanity, you find God setting up a table arrangement in the Garden of Eden. How do I know that? Because he said, I want you to look at everything here. It's all good for food. But there's one part of what you see that isn't good for food. I don't want you to consume this, which if God separates some things from another, that means the thing that he separates from actually is the holy thing. It's the sacred thing. God said when you come to table time, there are some things that are holy because it's a sacred space and a sacred moment. I don't know about you, but have you ever thought about the fact that God set the first table in Eden? And he said it as holy. You're set apart. There's some, some things that you're not to consume, which simply means that God set a table even in the presence of evil. God set a, a table for them in the presence of evil, and he said, let this be sacred. Let this be holy. Well, when they defiled what was holy at the table, they ended up being put outside of the garden. What was once provided, now they had to step outside of. But here's the deal. God actually set another table for them. And you find all through the Old Testament something called the table of Passover. Because they needed to recognize blood had to be shed and a lamb had to be slain and their house had to be covered with the blood of Jesus again because God has always been setting a table for his people. He set it in creation in sinless perfection. He set it in front of his people so that they would remember that he's always made a way for people to be able to come to his table 
And then you find Jesus. Jesus setting a table again not just cracker and juice. It was called the agape meal. It would often take hours because of its sacred, rich, deep quality. The New Testament church would practice this. And I I find it interesting that it's not just table centric in the New Testament church. You actually find when you get to the book of Revelations, a picture in eternity of a table that's been set for the people of God. You see, in Revelations chapter 3, I'll put this on the screen. It's a powerful verse. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together. His friends, God actually pictures in Scripture. The Holy Spirit sovereignly and supernaturally paints a picture of our salvation moment. Is a table moment. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. And if we would open the door, what, what door? It's, it's the door of, of my will. It's the door of surrender. And if I would open the door of my heart, Jesus would come in and sit down and begin to relate to us as if we're sitting at a family table. My own father, having become an alcoholic and walking away from God and trying to raise his family the best he knew how, marriage struggling, wondering how we're going to make this work. My mom having surrendered her life to Jesus and taking my two older brothers to church with her one morning was at church and my dad woke up hung over, miserable in life. Thought for a moment, man, God, if you're real, you got to show yourself to me. And he looked upon his dresser and there was a great big family Bible. He had purchased it when he was in the military, and the army. The Bible salesmen went barracks to barracks, if you've ever heard of such a thing, and, and sold a family Bible to him on payments. My dad had to put money in an envelope and mail it to him. And my dad bought this Bible because he just knew, man, maybe there's something in this for me, but I don't know what. And years later, he's sitting in his bedroom, rolled his feet out of bed and looked on the dresser, and there was that family Bible. His wife and Two sons were in church. He reached up and he grabbed the Bible and he let it fall open. And it fell open to Revelations chapter 3. And his eyes went to this verse. And he said, Lord, if if that's real, if you really come in and I open up the door of my heart, if you'll really come in and sup with me, you're going to have to prove it to me. You're going to have to show it to me. And he read that verse and he said, if you're real, God, come into my life. And he said there was something that touched the top of his head like electricity. And he said, fire, literally, just heat went throughout his entire body. And he began to tremble and shake sitting there. And he knew something was real. Something started to shift in his heart because I believe God created a table moment for him in the presence of his enemies. And from that day forward, he never never picked up uh, another bottle of booze. He never picked up uh, uh, another, another sinful tendency or habit. He had an anger problem that went away literally by the power of God in the moment. His conversion was sudden and supernatural because he opened the door of his heart. You see, table moments. Table moments can happen when you're on your own, when you're by yourself, Table moments of fellowship and something. That's why they're sacred. They're they're moments of interaction. They're moments of encounter. Can I tell you that the church has got to be centered around this idea of table? It's got to be something that's sacred and something that's revered as holy. The the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, I was reading about this, and, and he captured something that of this sentiment when he wrote this statement. I think it's pretty powerful. He said, when Jesus wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a theory, an outline, or a message. He sat down at a meal with them, and he gave them a table. He said, you want to know what the kingdom is about? It's, it's about sitting at a table and fellowshipping and relating together. Oshin said today that we needed to believe God for a a defense of unity in the house, that no matter what the enemy would ever try to do, that the people of God could not be stopped because of our unified effort. Can Can I tell you that if you'll focus on table, relating together and making it a sacred space, 
Every strategy of the enemy will be defeated. The purpose of God will continue because we're making Christ the center and we're actually in this together. So not only is it a sacred space, the second thing I want to tell you today is that the table is a Christ-centered gathering. A table is a a Christ-centered gathering. 1 Corinthians 11, I think, is very profound. I read it a minute ago, and I'll put it up here for you. The next slide, it says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this. What? Do, Do what? Do table time. Do this to remember me. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying this is the the new covenant between God and his people in agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to what? Remember me. And I don't, I don't know about you, but something has shifted in my heart working through these verses for, for months now. My wife and I, every other Friday night, have a group of people together just for fellowship. And just to to realize that time together is sacred, but it's sacred when Christ is the center and let me tell you how, how I've started to pray at meals. I, I stop and I say, God, you actually are the creator of all things. I have breath in my lung because of you. I, we have food on the table because of you. I, I want you to, to begin to, to stop and reflect on the fact that you have this building because of the Lord. You have the, the chairs that you're sitting on because of the Lord. Well, no, pastor, I gave to that offering. and I, Yeah, but you, you only have the money that you have because of the Lord. If the church loses its Christ-centeredness, if it loses its sacred nature, if it it loses the sense of awe and respect and and holiness and and, and the, the, the mutual respect and honor of sitting at a table with somebody whom God loves, who he's created in his image and who's going through a difficult season of brokenness, if I lose that sense of sacredness and then Christ centeredness I, I, I'm not here because I am anything special. I'm here because Christ chose me and he brought me into his family and I want to honor him for what he's done. We, we begin to get a little less nitpicky about things that we don't like. Can I tell you, one of the things that divides churches is, is, is we get more focused on what we want and, we, and, and what we like. Can I tell you that if Jesus is the center, I become second chair. I become third chair, fourth chair of far less importance because Christ is at the center and his mission is primary and, and he's actually come to seek and save the lost. So my whole life is actually focused on lost people in a world that's dying And whatever I have, I want to give to be used of the Lord. And for his purpose, I I actually become part of a family who's turned into an army. And and our table becomes an open space where lost people are welcomed and Christ is the center. Our homes are used for his purpose. You see, Christ was, was central to the Passover meal. and Christ was being foretold when the Passover lamb was slain and not one bone was broken. Many times people don't understand the implications of such a a small fact, but the Passover lamb in the Old Testament would be slain and the priests were very cautious. Make sure not one bone is broken. Why? Because they were telling of the day when Christ would hang on the cross, the lamb who would take away the sins of the world and not one bone of his would be broken. What was common in crucifixion was was that at some point the pain and the agony was so great, but yet they'd been propped up to prolong death. So they would break the bones of the individual hanging there so that finally suffocation would come. Finally, death would come. But Jesus had uh, the ability not only to hang on the cross and if he wanted, call angels Uh, to actually deliver him from such a horrific death, but he actually hung there with that ability and instead chose to give up his spirit because nobody would take his life from him by breaking bones in his body. Instead, he would surrender his life willingly. You see, the Passover lamb with not one bone broken would foretell a day when Christ would give his life as a ransom for you. Christ was foretold at the Passover table. Do you know that Christ was foretold right outside the gate of Eden when an animal was slain and blood was shed, the very first sacrificial animal, skins made to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. You see, the table was set again 
in the presence of their enemies, and Christ was foretold. Christ at the center of your home. Christ at the center of Apollo. Christ at the center of an elders' meeting. Christ at the center of a worship service. Christ at the center of your small group. Christ at the center of your conversation. Something deep happens when Christ followers gather at a table not to just eat a meal of symbolism. You see, we don't just come to communion time on a Sunday and say, wow, cool symbolism. No, it's, it's Jesus. He becomes the center, a life broken for us, a life given for us. The third thing that we see about the table is that it was a taste of eternity, a taste of eternity. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26 from the New Living Translation says this. It says, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup. Now, again, I want you to remember that this was in the context of a whole meal. It, it's not Western communion like you and I experience today. This is actually at a meal. They're having this experience as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You know, when believers gather and eat a meal where Christ is the center and they realize, man, this is a sacred moment. This is a holy opportunity. This might be on a Friday night in your home. And you know, man, we're just having a meal and we're going to play cards and we're, we're going to have a, a great time together. That's a sacred, holy moment. If you'd stop and pray and put Christ at the center of your life, it doesn't have to get weird and it doesn't have to get obnoxious. It just needs to stop and recognize the very fact we're in this place together is proof that Christ is alive and well. And we thank you, God, for what you've done. Stop and remember him. Stop and thank him for the beauty of what he's provided for you and the friends that you have. And drink deep. Talk, talk about the beauty of what he's done in your life. And then stop and say, Lord, until you come again, we're going to continue to remember you. And we're going to thank you for what you've done. You see, when the Old Testament prophets wanted to speak of a day when the reign of, of Christ's kingdom would finally come to its fullness, they actually would depict a great feast. In Isaiah chapter 25, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but Isaiah prophesied, and this is what he said, he he said, it's a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best meats and the finest of wines. Isaiah was trying to describe what it would be like when the rule of Christ's reign would finally come. And the best way he could describe it was to depict a table with all the best foods. Because when you sit at the table and you, you, you eat deeply and you drink deeply and you fellowship deeply and Christ is at the center, it's just a snapshot of what's to come. The Celts, the the great spiritualists of the first century would actually say that, that table fellowship was, was as close to eternity as a believer could ever get. Because, because you were right up at the veil of a moment where you're tapping into eternity. And why would they say this? They said it because at the end of time, we're actually going to sit at a table together. Revelations tells us this in Revelations 19. I'm going to just read it to you. It says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, the roar of rushing waters, and like, like loud peals of thunder, shouting hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And the angel said to me, Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Which simply means this, when we stand in eternity, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to sit at a table and we're going to eat and drink of the finest, finest foods. Come on, do I have any other foodies in the room today? Come on, we are going to sit at a table. And man, we are going to eat. <laughs> We're going to eat and we're going to fellowship. And what are we doing? We're celebrating all that we just had a taste of. 
When we lived in time and space and dealt with cancer and war and sickness and loss and brokenness and people who abandoned us and rejected us and abuse from people that that shouldn't have abused us and negative words from people who wanted to criticize us. When we tasted uh, eternity in all of those moments, we're finally going to be able to sit in a space. When all of the sorrow and all of the sickness and all of the disease and all the rejection is finally put in its place and all the unjust scales are made right and God has judged the living and the dead and we're going to sit down at a table in eternity and we're going to finally drink as deep as we were ever created to. So when we do that now, we're actually proclaiming the Lord's death and we're saying, man, we remember what he did and what he paid for because there's a day coming. And so when we slice the roast beef and we put it on the plate and we have a meal and we look at our fellow believers in the eye, what we're saying is a day is coming, people. A day is coming, people, when all the wrongs will be made right. When all the wrongs will be made right. And we begin to proclaim eternity and we do it in the here and now. I want to tell you that what our world is longing for is not just another church meeting. Man, church meetings are good, but can I tell you what they need is to be brought to the table of the Lord. They need to be brought into family. They need to be brought to something that's much deeper than a one-time Sunday experience. When they walk through the doors, yes, bring them into church. Yes, expose them to the presence of God. Yes, be aware and share the love of Jesus with them in this setting, but then say, come to my home with me. Come to the table with me. And let's, let's begin to actually expand the church from a Sunday gathering to a 24-7 experience where our homes are open and our lives are exposed and we create opportunity for Jesus to be the center of all that we do in love. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and this is where we're going to begin to wind this down. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, and together with them, We who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage one another with these words. Why why am I finishing with this? I'm finishing with this because many times we don't know how to encourage somebody in the moment. We don't know what to do when we're sitting at the table and somebody's truly in a Christ-centered setting, unpacking their lives and sharing their story. Christ is at the center. And what do we say? We say, you might experience some brokenness now, but can I tell you that if you surrender it all to Jesus, he's going to make all the wrongs right. And there's going to come a day, it might not be in the here and now, but there is going to come a day when he's going to deal with this. and He's going to work in your life. So man, let's stay connected and let's stay close and continue to encourage people with the taste of eternity. The taste of eternity. I believe when the church begins to center around the table, we actually realize that it's a place where Christ is at the center. It's a holy moment. And we can taste what God's ultimately done for his people in eternity. You see, I think what happens when believers gather and they follow the model of the church centered around the table is they allow themselves to be given in the same way that Jesus was given. See, Jesus sat at the table and he took bread and he, he gave thanks. And can I tell you that if you, you need a model of how to live your life table-centered, follow Jesus' model. Sit at a table and say, first of all, I just, God, I give you thanks for for allowing me to be part of your body. Everybody say, Lord, I give thanks. Just say that with me. Jesus not only gave thanks knowing that that bread represented his body, but then the Bible says he, he took bread, which meant that he allowed his body to be used. Can I tell you, if you want to be a a believer who's centered around the table, you've got to allow yourself to be given over into the hands of the Lord. 
See, table-centered Christianity isn't just about church attendance. It's about saying, God, take my life. Take my life. Take all of me. Take my gifts, my, my sense of, of, of self, self-thought and self-will. God, I just lay it all down before you. So, God, I give you thanks for what you've done in my life. Now take my life and allow your life to be broken. Allow your life to be broken. Well, Daryl, you don't understand my story. My, my life has been a story of brokenness. Welcome <laughs> to following Jesus. I've been broken over the course of my life, and can I tell you that my, area, my, my brokenness is actually the source of my ministry. Until you come to the table and you allow your life to be broken and you allow the brokenness of your life to be healed and to be used by the Lord, you'll never become as effective as God has called you to be. The area of your brokenness could be your greatest area of ministry, but you've got to bring it to Jesus. Not just to Jesus, you've got to bring it to the table of family. And once his body was broken, he said, now take, eat. I give this to you. The last thing that I will leave with you today is allow your life to be given away for somebody else. Allow your life to be given away for somebody else. You see, if you don't give away your brokenness, if you don't give away your life and its wholeness, if you don't give away your life and an attitude of gratitude towards the Lord, we become sour church attenders. We become a body of believers who thank God for a building, and then when somebody spills something on the carpet, we get wound up, and we say, man, I paid for that carpet. No, Jesus paid for your soul, and the carpet doesn't belong to you, and the chairs don't belong to you, and the building doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord, and it's all a tool in the hand of the Lord. Take what's been given to you, thank God for it, and then allow it to be broken and distributed and given and bring people to the table with you and point them to the same Jesus that saved you in the beginning and allow this place to become a place where Jesus is at the center. And every gathering is sacred, and everything that the Lord provides is met with great gratitude. And it's all for the purpose of being given away. It's all for the purpose of being given away.